Hello once again, another class on designing your own game for people who don't know what they're doing. Don't worry, nobody else does either. One thing I received from last time was for me to go in a bit more deeper detail about mechanics, the nitty gritty number crunchy nightmare fuel which has many, many people lose their minds in a desperate attempt to create. Don't worry, stop panicking, I'm here and it won't get any better. In 1999, in the early 2000s, veteran game designer Ron Edwards, an influential indie developer which you've probably never heard of, coined the GNS theory, which springboarded from an older threefold theory. GNS, in its simplest, states that there are three methods of interaction and engagement. Gamism, narrativism, and simulationism. While GNS has, and rightly so, been criticized due to some narrow-minded thought and holding narrativism on a pedestal, we can break it down pretty easily. I bring up GNS because here's the secret. I can't tell you what mechanics or dice to use, as the dice are simply a method of interaction with the world. It's about the intent and the ideas behind how, why, when, and where those dice are used. Whether you're a die-hard D20 fan or you'll sacrifice yourself upon an alt on a d6 dice pool, the idea is that any dice can be used to emulate any idea, but it's understanding what those ideas are and how they shape your mechanics around them. So I've changed around one word, creating the KNS model to help you, yes you, design your game. Simply, it's to break down broad methods to help you write something and why they are the way they are. The three are kinetic, narrativist, and simulationist. We'll think of a new game to represent all of these ideas. So let's have a swashbuckling pirate themed RPG with ship to ship combat and ferocious duels in a fantasy sky caribbean. Yeah, that'll work. We'll call it the Sky Ships of the Phantom Islands, or just Phantom Islands for now. Onwards to the main show. Our newest edition will be our first, because the alphabet demands it. Kinetic design can be best described as a game-first design, promoting a kinetic and tactile feel to play. All aspects of the game are built around doing that, playing, being a game first, while being a story or simulation Second, a popular example of kinetic design would be Dungeons and Dragons, the big boy himself, as the entire game is built around performing a game cycle. Go to place, do thing, acquire treasure. D&D is never about telling an exciting story or simulating the tense exchange of blow with blades. No, it's about rolling a d20 to hit a target's AC to reduce their hit points down by a weapon's damage. Kinetic games thrive off that idea. As the name implies, it's punchy and to the point refusing to elaborate or acknowledge parts that may bog things down in any method. Kinetic design is one of purely game thinking and theory, with mechanics to assist in that concept and little else. There are immediate risks, and there are immediate rewards, with trackable concepts to understand. Board games have understood this philosophy entirely, as playing Ticket to Ride isn't about simulating laying down tracks, having to transport the steel, hiring the riot workers, understanding the logistics behind it, nor is it a narrative, as there is no story except that what the board is set with the player stories taking precedence. I still want to strangle my friend because he cut me off at Dresden with his stupid train. I will find you. A fully committed kinetic designed game is one about the abstract of concepts to facilitate the act of performing those actions. I hit you with a gun that does 1d6 lightning damage. I trigger this engine to gain a plus 2 movement. I had my plus 3 to computers to hack into the mainframe. The main benefit of this design philosophy is that, well, it's easy to understand. Using D&D as an example, you don't need to be well versed in the intricacies of Kabbalistic magic or the differences of between a Claymore and a Zweihander. You need to know what your spell will do at the third level when you cast Fireball, which is going to deal 8d6 damage, and then a greatsword does 2d6 damage. This benefit is also its grand drawback. Kinetic design may be punchy and to the point, but you lose the background to the situation. At its worst, this, this can lead to nonsensical universe situations, but valid within the rules. One of the most famous of these being the Negadwarf Syndrome from Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition, rendering a competent player's dwarf, while naked, almost immune to damage. That abstraction can lead to a, a losing defined features of it. It's not a plasma cannon, it's a 3d6 
weapon. It's not the sacred armor of Arnor. It's a plus two plate mail. It's I'm not clinging to the side of the mountain holding onto dear life. It's the target number three successes and I have an 8d10 to my roll due to my skill allocations. Now, for the Phantom Islands, a kinetic design would be a game first, so our sword fighting would need to be easy to understand and our sky ships built with easier to understand resources. This is a 2d10 system. Our sword fights are quick and maneuverable, dashing around. Our fight ship combat has each player take control of cannons, repairing, and engines. Everything has a simple set of skills to flesh us out, with special schools for dueling, ship roll, and our career path. It's a straightforward game about stabbing bad men, shooting bad things, and driving our boat into the flying land of Havana. Narrative design is the second on the block, and perhaps the best poorly defined subject. Narrative design is best summarized as story first, with the mechanics in place to assist with the continued existence of that story. Games with a focus on this design often have a few things in common, but the most noticeable is that there's already a story baked into the game in some kind of a way. Now, w w what do I mean by that? A popular game, and one I've covered on here, would be Golden Sky Stories. GSS is built from the ground up to tell the story of the Henge, their lives, and the situations they find themselves in. The game really doesn't need to go into depth about the nature of their powers or the nitty-gritty details about their existence. They are the hench, they are in the town, and they do things in that town. The story is what drives the entire game forward, and the story is both well-defined and vague enough to fill in the gaps. Using GSS, the game can't really be used for anything else other than its particular tale of young creatures learning about the world in a particular village, and the game struggles to support anything else outside of that hyper-specific category. A narrative game has to understand and dedicate itself 100% to the tale it wants to tell. These tales are supported by the mechanics, with less than defined results often more than not. As a story is a fluctuating thing that fits the characters and the author. This story is being held up by a group of people telling it together. These narrativist mechanics drive that point home by being open to interpretation for the players and game master, allowing them to fit the flow more than a gamist or simulationist system would. A complete narrativist game is a collective story, with the mechanics in place to simply facilitate the discussion continue down the path. However, most narrativist games tend to have lighter mechanics, and if they do have heavier, more detailed set of them, they are often in service to a particular story beat or set of tropes mandated by that narrative. On the positive side, narrative design allows you to craft and detail things as you please, without needing to break your back in researching obscure topics or having to reason out complex concepts. This control of the story is a boon, allowing you, the designer, to craft the game in a particular way that you want it to go down. The problem. Well, we got one little problem. Narrative games rely on the narrative. I know, amazing. If that story you are telling isn't actually interesting, have any meaningful moments, or is just a blank slate, those story mechanics stop meaning anything. Going too heavy on the narrative also removes some of the agency a player may have, as the story, tropes, and expectations pre prevent them from making something truly their own. Those loose interpretations and ideas may seem good now, but it has the player lose control and force them to obey the GM story which they have in their head which may depend depending on the moment. The Phantom Isles as a narrative's game using playing cards with characters defined both by their role on the ship as well as their personal archetypes, having them take the role of dashing captains, ferocious first mates, and cheeky gunners, all telling the pirate story. When a check is needed, it's broken down into vague concepts, engaging in a duel, draw three cards, and try to play them correctly. Maybe your captain ability allows you to destroy diamonds reserved for conversing or talking to combat situations due to your Panache. Our final method to madness 
is simulationism, which is perhaps one which has people to be the most concerned hearing. Probably the first thing that comes to your mind is something like Phoenix Command or other Hyper Crunch games that track literally everything. The secret to simulationism is that it doesn't have to be that. Simulationism is all about putting the world first, before the game or the narrative, striving to tell its story without with making you live in the world it's taking place in. We only use Phoenix Command as stated above. Phoenix Command was arguably one of the first games to truly attempt to simulate modern combat including 39 separate hit locations and having guns perform fairly accurate well as accurate as the table can simulate them. This is a bit on the extreme side, but Phoenix Command's extreme detail was to simulate a modern gunfight, including everything that can and will and has gone wrong in one. Getting shot in your chest is pretty damn bad. Getting shot in the neck is a death sentence, and having your leg clip is moderately dangerous at best. Why? Because getting shot is bad for your health. A gun in a game system may do 3d8 damage, and a narrative system may put on a severe condition, but a simulationist game will give you the tools needed to show you the ins and outs of a bullet going in and out of you. Now, simulationism isn't always about combat or actions. It can be how you interact with the world as well. Engine Heart is not a complex game, but it simulates the efforts a tiny robot has to undergo to survive in that world. From having to manage energy consumption to having to worry about being reprogrammed rather than strictly just dying. The core behind simulationism is that you're attempting to make your world feel alive, to make your players a part of that world even if the gameplay suffers and the narrative is restricted. Let's take something simple to understand, such as driving a car. In the game system, each vehicle may have a handling rating that gives a 1 or 2 plus bonus to a check to pull off a stunt. A narrative system may not even have to worry about the car just putting on a condition of high speed or something similar. A simulation game, at its most extreme, would have max speed, handling, tires, engines, and everything else, making sure that getting in a sports car and big bonus Bubba's truck feels very different. Making a turn going 140 miles an hour is difficult and requires pre-planning to compensate for the momentum. Then there's the weight to worry about, and that isn't even factoring in if the car is in decent enough condition to begin with. Simulationism is about putting you in the seat of that car, making you think on your toes about hitting the handbrake to make a turn, but oh god that turn is too tight for you so you're gonna scrape along the side. Investment in the setting. The world and the ideas the game wants you to be invested in is priority number one. At its most extreme, simulationism can bog down a game pretty hard, tracking every little thing and every little aspect down to the most minute detail, making sure that you have the right clip loaded, or double checking that the engine on the plane isn't critically damaged. On a positive note, however, simulating the world can make it feel alive removing the player with their ideas and placing them in that world, forcing them to think ahead and be a part of that ecosystem you've made. The major issue with simulationism is that it can be very dull if done poorly, and its abstraction helps us skip to the entertaining bits. D&D is not a simulation because it's boring to do that. It goes against what the game is trying to do. It simply abstracts your ability to not take damage. Golden Sky Stories is not a simulation because it has zero interest in doing that. It's about being the henge and telling a story with those characters. However, taking a bullet in Phoenix Command may take five minutes to resolve for a two second round, but you took a bullet because you weren't in cover and they have a killing ground over you. Luckily, it only grazed your shoulder, it hurts like hell, and the adrenaline is pumping in your system, but you'll live. The Phantom Islands, as a simulation game, is a heavily detailed look at what it means to be a sky pirate. Taking the time, the ship, and the people are all detailed enough to make sure that that vessel is a flying fortress of your own design and weight. We'll probably have to make it a D100, game to track those little 1s and 2 percents. Flying is hard, but do you really think we can afford 10 cannons? Hell no! We're getting two because we can outpace any ship we come across at a given time. Our captain's a great fencer, but he usually just likes to put a ball in through his opponent's shoulder for the quick kill because guns hurt. And that's the end of our KNS journey.
The most important thing to remember is that you're going through the very first steps of designing your game is to determine what you want to make. Making a hardcore simulation at Sky Piracy is going to be a lot different than making a game about the romantic pulp of high sky swashbuckling. When designing any system in your game, it's going to have aspects of KNS in it. Something may be more narrative, while others may be more gamist, and even a system to simulate something. The core idea is to have a core mechanic that really sings to do what you want it to do. So among our three variations, the Sky Pirates of the Phantom Isles, which is the correct version, the 2D10 Gamus version, the card-based narrative version, or is it the percentile simulated crunch? The answer is all of them. Each have different goals and ideas they want to show off. However, the Gamus version doesn't need hardcore shipbuilding, while the narrative version doesn't need to really bother with equipment. To summarize, when designing your core mechanic, think about what you want to accomplish. Something crunchy and simulationist is going to need a more robust system, attract values, and express bonuses. While a narrative game just has to focus on the tropes, may not even need the more advanced than a die roll or two. Your options will begin to narrow down, desires align with needs, and suddenly you'll have the perfect idea, the perfect thing which you want to do. Which is why I recommend that you read everything! Find games, do what you want, and see what they did. Ask yourself what you're trying to get across to the world. Most importantly, what do you find fun? Writing mechanics you don't want to play is a surefire way of you not caring about them. That's all the insight I can offer on the matter. You choose from what you know and want. So, what are your personal takes on the KNS theory? I could probably break it down a bit further, but I don't really need this to in this little craft slum. For game devs out there, what made you choose your core mechanic? Was it the need for the system? Did you take it from somewhere else? Or did you already have the idea down and built around it? So, thank you for watching. My name is Notepad Anna. If you like what I do here, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Sayonara, until next time. It will be shorter. I swear.